I wish to acknowledge them as its traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from any other community who may be here today. We would like to start the evening off with the welcome from James, who is the current FSSM president. So this evening, uh, we are fortunate to be surrounded by a diverse group of people, each with a unique story. But uh, tonight we all have one thing in common, and that is we are curious. Um, we are all curious medical students, naturally inquisitive group of people, but um, tonight it's all led you to ask the question, what, what does it mean to be a surgeon? Uh, RACS, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, defines it as, or its new manager is, let's operate with respect. So I thought we'd briefly talk about my little journey into becoming, wanting to be a surgeon and what it means to be respectful. So my personal journey to surgery began, it was all out of luck. I was fortunate enough to have great mentors like Professor Drummond who really inspired me and gave me the confidence to go into theatres, to be curious, to ask questions and to really feel like I belonged there. And it led me to meet a man who had esophageal cancer, a fascinating condition um, and which is quite, causes quite painful swallowing and it's very debilitating. But this man was due to have a reconstructive procedure. So I followed the plastic surgery team into theatre one day. He had his esophagus removed and then the plastics team took a piece of skin from his leg and they made a tube out of it with the arteries attached and plugged it into his neck to form a new esophagus. And it just blew me away that this was possible. <clears throat> that this was possible. I just, that propelled me down the pathway of surgery. But I believe it's uh, important to highlight to those people who are yet to experience the cutting edge of medicine, pardon the pun, uh, that excellence in the operating theatre is not the only thing that makes a surgeon. It's only one of many important aspects. And to me, a person that embodies a curious spirit that puts patient care first and is an advocate, but also is a friendly voice to guide people through what is sometimes the most fearful moment of their lives. A surgeon is a leader, one who inspires, who is humble, and always strives to do better. A surgeon is respectful, is to honour the vulnerability when a patient entrusts their care and their life to you. It is to value your team members as your equals, from the head of surgery to the cleaning staff, and to constantly be curious as to how you can better yourselves and the systems around you to ultimately get the best in patient care. So whilst we should also aspire to these values, it's undoubtedly going to be challenging to be an individual with integrity throughout this process and be true to yourself, no matter what path you choose. And I hope that the surgeons here tonight both inspire you but also show you that surgeons do have a life outside of medicine and it doesn't mean giving up everything in the process. And so finally, I'd like to thank these wonderful surgeons and registrars and residents for coming here tonight to share our passion for surgery. And I hope that after tonight, you all appreciate your surgical terms with as much excitement as the others and seek out the opportunities that I and so many others were so lucky to have. Briefly to acknowledge uh, Nips, who is our gold sponsor. Um, Margaret is here tonight and has been with us for a number of years now, and without Nips, we couldn't do many of the things that we do to support your education, skills, and otherwise. So thank you for coming, Margaret, tonight. I'd also like to thank Shreya Jane and Izzy, who have done a fantastic job organising this event for you all, as I'm sure you're about to witness. Finally, I encourage you all to be curious these surgeons afterwards as your colleagues after our formal And most of all, that no matter what area of medicine you choose, I encourage you all to operate with respect. Thank you. Thank you, James. And we would now like to welcome Margaret from MIPS to tell us a bit more about MIPS and what they can do for us. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, I feel quite honoured to be here tonight and uh, going on from what James was saying about being curious, James is a very curious individual and um, <laughs> and, and dedication. Um, we've bought, we've uh, formed a pretty um, pretty good bond I think and a pretty good relationship with NIPS and the um, Surgical Society. Um, and um, at this we're very, very um, enthusiastic and 
enthusiastic is probably the best word, in supporting um, student education and um, student doctor education. So that's why we support these types of um, events, and particularly the Surgical Society. James was as well rubbed, on, rubbed off on me with, um, with forming a, a good relationship. So uh, thank you, James. Thanks. Um, so just briefly, um, obviously we're here to protect your to protect you. Um, have two ways that we can do that. This is just the I have to tell you, um, just getting general uh, information, not um, personal information. Um, so our purpose is to protect, support, and safeguard the professional character and interests of our members. Um, the main benefit of our membership is professional indemnity. Um, and that's what we, we strive to provide, and we strive to provide that in a very professional um, uh, manner, and there's certain ways we do that. Um, our key objective is to promote honourable and discourage irregular practice. We're not for profit, um, and we've actually reached 50,000 million now, so that needs to be updated. We just um, reached that uh, last week, so we're very, uh, very happy about that. CDO, but we are the most financially stable, so um, uh, mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's one of the good reasons for being with us as well. Um, so why would you why would some why would you need indemnity? Because when you are a student, obviously the um, the university has their own indemnity, and um, when you're doing clinical um, rotations or when you're in the hospital, the hospitals have their own indemnity as well. And you would always go to them first if something did happen. In the they can't um, assist you with or cover you for civil claims, um, complaints, um, and investigations by UPLA. Um, so that's why we're around. So we do um, support you and cover you throughout your career. And there's a bit of a flow chart there of how we can support you. So we support you and cover you through your university years. Obviously, um, if you're on next Sunday, I know that it's free at the moment. Um, then when you go into your internship, we don't charge you again for the first six months um, because that's the year that you um, start thinking about which MDO you'll probably stay with for the rest of your medical career. And um, we at MIPS encourage you to be members of everyone, um, all the other MDOs still at this stage um, because it's a good opportunity for you to see how we are all different. Um, maybe, you know, it's a bit of like try before you buy, I guess. So check out what we do without having to pay at least you've made an informal decision, uh, informal, yeah. A formal um, decision then about um, informed decision about who you will stay with for the rest of your medical career. Um, from um, June each year, we have a renewal stage. So then, for the next, so if you are a final year student, an intern, in the first six months you won't pay anything. It's free, um, and then the next twelve months we don't charge you anything again. Next, actually pay your membership on your behalf. And how we can do that is because we are very financially stable. And we actually, um, until postgraduate year three at the moment. Um, and then as you, obviously as you um, go on and specialise and whatnot, um, your circumstances change, you do need to let us know. And obviously, you know, then you do start having to pay. Uh, but we are quite competitive with the other NGOs as well. Um, so as I said, it's, um, student membership is free and we waive our um, membership fees for recent graduates. Um, as a student, you, your membership covers you for clinical, clinical activities um, while you're doing your clinical rotations overseas and um, or if you're doing John's <coughs> placement here in Australia um, and also with Samaritan X. Some of the things that you might do in your clinical activities, taking history, writing a patient management plan, um, ordering and interpreting investigations and communicating with patients and if at any stage you you find that something's um, occurred or there's something that you've been asked to do that's out of your scope of practice, um, you can give us a call 24-7 and you'll actually speak to a doctor. We have doctors um, on the end of our 24-7 hotline. Maybe it's just peace of mind to, to speak to someone about. And we would rather that you call us again and again and get some advice, even if it's a silly question and you feel like it's really stupid <laughs> and you're know, taking up someone's time by asking this. We would rather that you do that than whatever you're calling about turns into a claim or turns into a complaint. A case study, more important things to listen to. Um, so that's the elective cover there. 
Um, if you're going to the US, unfortunately, we can't cover you. Um, another good thing about MIPS is MIPS protections, and that covers you for non-indemnity work-related matters. So um, things that we've, we've covered for students have been uh, plagiarism, bullying and harassment. So there's a whole range of things because it doesn't come under the normal indemnity banner. Um, it is uh, sent up to the board and it's um, up to the board's discretion um, if they'll cover you for that or not. Um, um, but that's not our main focus. Our main focus is on um, the indemnity cover. But the travel insurance is there for you if you are going overseas to do an elective or if you're doing any volunteer work overseas. And we are on social media. Um, so if you um, are on Facebook or Instagram, you can um, befriend us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. And we pop up a lot of um, uh, current topics um, up on Facebook and um, a lot of our competitions go on Facebook and Instagram as well, so look out for those. And just to let you know, we've got a competition at the moment, closes tomorrow, <coughs> pretty getting quick. Um, no, actually Friday, Friday closes, sorry. Um, so you could win one of two $500 travel vouchers, so good if you're wanting to go on an elective in the very near future. Um, you just need to go onto that website there, so just nips.com.au slash chatterbox, and there's a couple of very easy questions to answer. Um, and I'll just leave you with this. Um, I heard someone say this just recently, you can't make a reputation in a day, but you can ruin one. And unfortunately, um, sometimes by doing something people can ruin a reputation that you guys have built so hard to, um, to strive for and work for. And um, that's why we're here. This is here to help you keep that good reputation that you've built. So, um, hope you enjoy the night. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be outside <coughs> afterwards. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's get started. So this year the format of our careers night is a little bit different from those that we've had in the past. Um, it's evolved quite a lot from when we first started planning it. Um, but our goal, which we decided very, very early on in the piece, has always been in sight. And that is to showcase to you all the vast spectrum of opportunities available in a surgical career. To achieve this, we needed a very exciting diverse group of surgeons. And with thanks to our subcommittees across all of our clinical schools, we're proud to present these surgeons uh, who have generously contributed their time to be on tonight's panel. We represent many, but despite our best efforts, unfortunately not all of the surgical specialties recognised by the Royal Australian College of Surgeons, Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, these surgeons, also representing most of the clinical schools of the medical school, bring with them a huge wealth of experience gained from all corners of the globe. Uh, in, in, in areas encompassing clinical surgery, research, academia, the military, um, humanitarian work, and much more. Tonight, you will have your perception of a surgical career broadened, if not challenged, and that you will have the opportunity to ask all that you've ever wondered about a surgical career uh, from these leaders in their respective fields that we're lucky enough to have with us tonight. Let's introduce the panel now, and as I introduce them, they will come up and sit on these beautiful chairs up here <laughs> for us. Um, so in order, we have Prof, uh, Professor Robert Jones. <laughs> Thank you. We have, in order? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little bit strict with these things. Um, so we then have Associate Professor Sebastian King. Unfortunately, we think Mr Dundee is running a little bit late, who's representing urology, but we'll introduce him once he arrives. And we've then got Associate Professor Kate Drummond, Mr. Naveen Allen, Associate Professor Martin Richardson, Dr. Charlotte Elba, Ms. Karen Barclay, and Mr. Waiting Choi. All right, so what we'll do is we'll start off with a Q&A discussion with the panel. Um, we'll go down the line and we'll start off with having uh, each of these surgeons introduce themselves very briefly 
and then we'll ask you a few questions. Now we're all here to hear about your experiences, so we hope that um, any of you will jump in if you've got anything to share. Um, and the same goes to the audience. If you have any um, questions for the panel or any comments to make, um, just please jump in. Um, so, and then after that, we'll have a few general questions to look at the panel uh, to get your combined insights. Um, and then at the very end, we'll step outside where we'll have some delicious food prepared by the professional State House in Carlton. Um, we'll have some drinks and we'll have the opportunity for our students to approach some of these surgeons and ask the questions that they have not easy. So, um, we'll get started. Prof. Joe, welcome. Right. In just uh, two minutes, could you tell us... Um, <laughs> 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 could you give us some highlights of how you got to where you are today? General surgeon. Um, uh, and when I went through, it was obvious that you had to choose a subspecialty. And I was in the UK at the time, and I was working for a mentor who said, you've got to do something. And a job came up in transplantation. In fact, it was the only job, so I said I'll do that. So it was rather serendipitous, and uh, it was in liver transplantation, and, uh, and I then got involved in liver and had a bit of surgery, which was very much part of that. Petrunus, but it kind of figured with what I was doing. Right, so I also then got a job in Melbourne because once you head down these very narrow pathways, there's often aren't too many opportunities that come up. Of course, if a job does come up in that area, there aren't too many people competing for it. <laughs> so when I was sort of getting toward the end, a job came up, a job offer in Melbourne. And I uh, took it because it was the only job offer I had. <laughs> so, but it actually kind of suited me and traditionally as my family as my family were here, so that would have worked out by the way. Um, and I liked transplantation because it fitted with all the things that I'd done before, between medical, the, an area that was surgical, a lot of medical interface, a lot of collegiate activity. You had to work with lots of other people to make this work. And there's a lot of general medicine and other very interesting things as well as ethical issues. Interesting non surgically related things, so compared to orthopedics. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't last five minutes without an author. <laughs> Anyone to flash it? So I'm a pediatric colorectal surgeon, which is very sub specialised. We're going further and further down a rabbit hole. Um, but I'm originally from Sydney and I did work experience as a 10-year-old in, in a hospital and really fell in love with pediatric surgery for that. Uh, and because of the surgeon who was doing it at the general hospital but coming from the main seemed really keen, enthusiastic in, in those in his late 50s, early 60s, being burnt out by surgery and was still enjoying teaching and all the various weird wonderful stuff that you get to see in pediatrics. So I did my um, training in Sydney, uh, my undergrad training, and then I wanted to do some research. So uh, for, again, fortuitously, one of my mentors in Sydney, I said, I'm going to do some research with you for a year, and he said, don't bother doing that because you're not going to learn anything. But I worked with this guy called John Hudson in Melbourne. You probably all had lectures from at various stages. And so John mm -hmm. turned out to be a superb and a mentor who did my PhD with him. To Sydney. My wife's also from Sydney, and my mother in law was very keen for us to come back to Sydney. Um, but as life turns out, this is the place that for me to for the best sort of academic pediatric surgical jobs. I'm 100% of the children's, but I'm 50% clinical and 50% research. That doesn't always work out that way. Um, I'm a <laughs> Sorry, we're having some issues with the slides, but I've got it now. <laughs> you have ruined everything. <laughs> we'll make it happen. But, um, yeah, I'd like to see some because I also um, spend a lot of time in public hospitals, so mainly at um, Western and Boston. And um, do a broad range of plastic and constructive work. Um, and you know, it's always very 
sort of reflect on how you go into that. Um, again, also a bit of mind luck, and you know, I do have a little anecdote because when I was a legal student stage. I remember there was, a, there was a guy who was in roughly the same year. He was writing the good method. Mm -hmm. He used to write in the good method about uh, how wonderful plastic surgery was, and you know, all of his articles would have female forms, silhouettes, and that kind of thing. <laughs> but um, so he definitely knew that uh, he ended up being a. Uh, Cosmetic surgeon, and unfortunately, a few years ago, was uh, suspended from the medical board for sleeping with his patient. <laughs> <laughs> One of his patients, at least. <laughs> so, I guess the, I guess the point of that is really that um, it's okay, really, and what you um, are going to end up as. <laughs> And um, you know, like um, fashion also, I've done a little bit of research, and I did some research actually in some obscure neurological imprints, and, and um, which has got nothing to do with it. And, uh, and it was really only by a series of jobs that um, plastics seemed like a good fit and there was the support to get in there. And again, you know, echoing what Scott was saying, you know, the mentors that you were on the way are very important in the UK government. You were my resident. In, 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 <laughs> So, um, so um, be be open to possible um, because what you might think you want to do you may, not, you may not end up being. Ready. Also, it's good to aim for that. But, um, it might be. Uh, do you have anything else? That's a piece of advice. Uh, so I'm probably going to say the same thing. I ended up in I'm a neurosurgeon, role model in hospital, neurosurgery, a combination of what everyone else did, blind luck, good mentors, uh, a good patient experience, uh, and something that I was ended up being really interested in into medicine by accident. Um, couldn't think of anything else to do. I wanted to be uh, an obstetrician. Sorry, then I delivered a baby and said I'm never going to do that ever again. <laughs> I like the surgery, so the gynecological surgery, so I thought that I would do general surgery. Um, <coughs> and then just out of complete luck, got a, a term in neurosurgery as an intern, had a sort of James like experience uh, of a patient who I had a brain tumour who I really thought this is something that I can really do and these, this is a patient I can really look after. I was in Sydney, uh, trained most of my training in Sydney, came to Melbourne to do some research and never went home because this was the place to be for me, a job <coughs> opportunity and a fantastic mentor was there and so I sort of stayed sort of doing mostly brain tumour work, academic neurosurgery ever since. Um, and I also like it because it's that combination of medicine, um, good patient care, surgery, research, all of those things together. Thank you. <coughs> um, I uh, grew up in Canada and did all my um, education there as well as my surgical training. And I decided to go, I'm sorry. I'm a thoracic surgeon. So what you probably heard from all of us, we're all very specialized, not just a special surgeon, but then on top of that, subspecialized. So and that's probably a function of the fact that we're all at the University of Melbourne and have tertiary care staff and decided to 
quite early on that I liked surgery. I was inspired very early, but I didn't like the idea of, for example, taking out someone's appendix and then never seeing them again after a post op visit. So I was looking for something that was a continuity of care or something. So that's what drove me to the oncology. And um, one thing that I like, uh, what, I, what drew me to thoracic surgery was not so much now, the fact that, you know, someone can die because they offered on them, which was exciting, but I that's not it. Uh, much less exciting when you're the consultant. It's really kind of cool when you're the resident, but, you know, life and death might play with time and event. Um, but the idea of continuity of care is very important to me. Sometimes, often I'm the first person to tell someone they have a cancer diagnosis, and so that's not <coughs> a pleasant thing to do, but it's something that's important to do well, and so um, that definitely interact with patients, which you don't get in all areas of medicine, you don't get in all areas of surgery, but that's one of the things that I really need, and also the technical side. Since I've been a consultant, I've, my focus has been uh, less on research and much more on teaching uh, at all levels, so teaching at the medical school, student level, intro and extra, and also uh, consultant level. So I travel uh, around Asia um, and run courses in uh, minimum invasive thoracic surgery three or four times a year, and involved with a, with a group of surgeons uh, that does that. And that's uh, very much surgery. You don't just do surgery, you can do so much. Yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. In uh, Edinburgh Hospital, I wear many hats. I'm also a Surgeon Commander in the Navy Reserve and get to uh, serve in various parts of the world. Uh, Afghanistan 2014, I'm not quite sure what I'm saying. Trump or was promised Mr. Trump about where we're going next, but uh, I suspect we're somewhere exciting, so that'll be good. Um, I decided I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon when I was in year 11 at school. Um, I was an athlete at the time and I injured my ankle and I went and saw Ian McLean, who got me back on track with my ankle, and I thought, wow, this is what I want to do, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. So that made the rest of things reasonably easy. I knew I had to get in medicine and I knew I had to. Um, do some surgical residencies when I you know, threw intern PGY2, PGY3. Taylor, who uh, many of you may know, a plastic surgeon who developed the pre flap and worked with these plastic surgeons uh, for a couple of years at Fort Wayne. He did all the I did all the fantastic. You know, I sort of sat back and thought, what the plastic surgeons make the money doing? And have the. Uh, the um, uh, personality to sort of you know, make people beautiful, I suppose. So I prefer to make people better so they can go back to their sport or they can't walk around a golf course in the near patient so they can go and do that. I suppose that's the other thing in orthopedics is fantastic. No cancer, it's very well, unless they have a pathological fracture that we fix and then they get back on with things. But you treat patients from birth to little children with a dislocated dips and puffed feet and all that sort of thing. So we're 104 and four in the nursing home and break their hip and you can fix the broken hip and send them back to the nursing home. So you've got the, the continuity care there. The other thing about me, fix their uh, shoulder. I saw a patient this afternoon who I fixed their shoulder 2002 or 2003, something like that. And they come back having out their other shoulder. Well, as well, I've come back for their knee replacements and then they <laughs> <laughs> And then they send their family. So we do have a fruit and flower program. They just keep coming back. So the beauty of all the clinics is that uh, you want to do some all multiple joints. And it's <laughs> <laughs> so general. And it's interesting when we're talking about the specialities. Many of my um, right hip toe surgeons or left ankle surgeons, that's a little bit sad. And I think that uh, you know, they do these still themselves. They've had this wonderful training to become an orthopedic surgeon. And then they super specialise, if you like, like big toes. I suppose that's okay, but I prefer to actually be able to fix multiple joints. In 2010, uh, I've been doing a lot of teaching, like in the V, around the world, and saw a couple of people like Jeff Rosenfeld and uh, Annette Hollian and uh, John Crozier, all who have been doing this wonderful things with the military, John and V to Rwanda, the terrible you know, genocide in Rwanda, and they never gone up and take a whole lot of lives from the tsunamis in. Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, 
at that stage, the waiting list in the public hospital system has blown out to five years, and I'm thinking, I'm really not helping these people out well. I need another challenge. So I left the public system, concentrated on, on my private practice, so I could actually go for another challenge and join the Australian Navy. We've had a number of challenges, as I said, I went to Afghanistan for four, four months in 2014. And when we go into a place like that, we're generally sent with a general surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, an intensivist, and an anesthetist. And there are two people badly injured from firefight or whatever, and they've had a round through their belly. I'll be starting a formal laparotomy when my general surgeon is a lot quicker and better for doing those who's doing this thing. And when he's finished doing that, he'll come and help me finish the formal laparotomy. And if there's two people who've got a round through their tibia or femur or something like that, I'm going to be a bit quicker putting an external fixer on. I'll come and help my mate out with uh, the external fixer he's putting on. So we can keep general. We can keep our skills. We run a number of courses to allow an orthopedic surgeon to be able to do damage control, laparotomies, and uh, uh, thoracotomies for trauma situations. Maintain my skills and uh, uh, something in surgery would get a lot of wonderful skills. And I'll suggest that uh, I have certain value to keep in those skills rather than becoming a right with pro surgeon or left ankle surgeon. So, um, Thing I'm fascinated with, like new is issues. So I've just finished Master of Surgical Education, which is something that the University of Melbourne offer with the College of Surgeons, and get to the stage of wanting to learn more about teaching and how you teach other people surgery. Uh, I challenge you to do that course. It's an amazing course to make you a better teacher. And uh, as certainly, I thought I was a reasonable teacher when I was I went through. Um, my early surgical career and then the light bulb went up and I started doing this course and put my skill levels as a teacher significantly higher. So when you get to that stage, you can only treat one patient at a time, but if you teach a room like this, the skills to do this you can treat many people all at once. Thank you. Dr. Elder, uh, Hi, so I think I'm a Delone non rats person here in the room. Um, and I've said to the gynecologist where the minds um, a little bit of surgery and medicine and a little bit of psychiatry at times. Um, so, so we get to get through with everything. Um, and part of the reason I like it, I'm, I'm another stupidly specialised doctor. Um, so I'm a paediatric analyst and gynecologist. I kind of rail against being stupidly specialised. When I was a medical student, I sat in um, with um, someone who went on to become one of my mentors, um, Professor Grover. And um, I sat in for one clinic of care and I thought, this is amazing. Here, yeah, this is really fantastic. And I walked up and I went, hey, dickhead, what kind of a moron is a medical student sitting in a pediatric gynecologist? I mean, there's only one. Because I didn't want people to think I was walking around wanting to be a left post pediatric surgeon. I didn't say anything. And then, um, and then I, did, um, I did my uh, clinical study in the country, which was absolutely fantastic. We were just going on. And, um, and then came back, and because I've never actually worked in a tertiary hospital, I could not to the outbreak just to go somewhere where I'd never ever been. Um, and, um, and then I was looking at jobs for my second year, and I was a little bit busy. And um, someone said to me, I was like, oh, I don't know whether I should, I'm going to do a surgery here, but we're doing all the jobs to do. And they said, you idiot, you can do great obstetrics and gynecologists, do a team at Sandringham. And I was like, oh, okay. And I did that and went, oh, that's right. This is um, so I think we've kind of been sort of end up coming to us. Um, and um, now I subsequently went on um, and did a set of gynecology. And then, um, again, wasn't really thinking about the pediatric side of things um, until I was eating lunch one day and just chatting with Sonia because she was sitting at me eating lunch. And she mentioned she had a fellow. And I said, oh, you're a fellow? And she said, oh, yeah. Tell me what they do. And she told me, I'm like, and how do I apply? <laughs> and she was like, really? I'm a guest? We've only just met, but yes, I'd like to meet for you. <laughs> and, um, and so then I subsequently went on and became a fellow and um, I did the through that. Um, I then went on to do further training. Well, because pediatric analyst at a lot of is not a, uh, not a common thing, there's no actual Australian qualifications. So I've gone and done the international qualifications. I've got, I suppose, a bit of something behind me because it's so the relative of the new faculty. But um, like everyone was saying, it's, um, it's an opportunity to really change people's lives and to really get involved in. Um, 
the other thing that I was toying around with the idea of before I then went up and worked at Cambridge and I realized I loved old age was, um, was actually the neurology because I can't tell this stuff to a trained psychologist. Um, and I thought but I could not hang out with neurologists. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with that. And um, subsequently, I actually work with kids and your oldest the kids, and they're actually kind of cool. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice to be hanging out with the other sex that have as many kids that want to talk to you. So I also work um, in uh, general knowledge as well. Um, I have a very diverse practice, so every day there's some kind of scanning practice as well. So um, after I leave, I just um, do a miscarriage clinic, which is all of the sound. And um, I also work in family planning, which is something I'm really passionate about, um, giving people policies about them. Um, so that's a really good Hi, my name is Lisa Lee. I'm a congressional journalist surgeon. Um, you're like another one out in the first thing to do with the So I was the surgeon in the town of the old one door, and we've done four Surgery, it does become more consuming. 
Um, but we need to start early saying, um, which I didn't do, and I've made, made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, but I didn't want that balance and I didn't strive to teach um, at, at all. Um, and I would have done things differently, but really just realised there is more in the world to take all those opportunities and not to pay to a focus on those um, that are here. I think that's um, what I would find to do. I'm also doing a Master's in Public Health at the moment, which is um, just kind of made me realise that, wow, there's even more more. So you can even get to a stage. Um, and then there is still more. So it's lots of opportunities. Yeah, I think that um, surgical training is evolving but quite slowly. So I don't think we're at anywhere near the stage of the obstetrics, gynecologists, college or paediatrics training. I think mm. most of us who come from a surgeon that I know I think we've gone through pretty much uninterrupted. Um, and um, but I think what it means is more people who demand a more flexible training scheme in the college, I think, is on the cusp of providing it. I do it this statement. Not actually. Oh, no. Three of the trainees are doing part time training. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I think it will happen, and I think we're thinking about I mean, I might work in a couple of hospitals uh, with um, trainees. And, um, and certainly being asked the question, it, it certainly is doable, but, it's, uh, but to make a concrete thing, people have to demand. And, and, and it is sort of happening. It also depends on, the, bit depends on the, the particular specialty. So in pediatric surgery, the money, 70 to 75% of our trade came up, right. um, which is when you compare that to the 5 to 10% for all the So mm. obviously there's, there's an enormous um, discrepancy there. So therefore, over the last 10, 15 years before pediatric surgery, we've had to really work out the ways that they're going to be able to do part time training. And with, a significant amount of trainees over the last 10 years have taken breaks, um, uh, six to 12 month breaks with, uh, with um, their children. Um, and also, well, the neurosurgeons do for all time, you know, the research is a scrap. But um, again, being able to say, well, I'm halfway through the training program, actually, I'm really enjoying doing this, but I'd like to take a couple of years off this research. And uh, again, the training board is slowly getting better at saying, well, the issue of a skills based specialty is that um, when you stretch it out, you still need to spend the time training. I think that, um, and I think this is what's been found, it's a bit more cock off because it's uh, like a lot of number of hours. The same is that clinical experience is going to be that training experience is going to be diminished so much. And I think it's really important that that time is still done. Flexibility in terms of draw that out, and I think that's a concern when parents or the leaders to want to view of it too. So it is a tricky issue. Um, even if we go, say, you know, stimulated training, which is slowly coming in, um, I think that's quite strange. I think there's. Um I'm just going to give a little anecdote. anecdote. I mean, there's no doubt in surgery that it, there's a tremendous sense of responsibility. That smoking gun analogy, you walk into a room and there's a body on the floor and blood, and somebody's standing there with a smoking pistol. Everybody knows who did it. So it creates in the surgeon, I think, a sense of responsibility. And I've seen that with Porter, who's just completed a guy in surgical training. And her partner's in an intensive care position. And he finds it very really frustrating that she wants to go and put so much time in clock up and then has to understand that she wants to be there and see and follow up to get the experience and then hold it. So there's no doubt that I think surgical training has this component if you're doing it, you probably despite it, you want to be part of it, and you will end up putting a lot of time. Maybe you have to, but maybe you want to. I think Charlie has been partnering with an artist. <laughs> 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 and they have zero idea about what you actually do, so I think it's really important. 
as you get older and zippy, sometimes what you want to do changes. And what might be incredibly exciting and invigorating when you're 30 isn't the same when you're 45. Mm -hmm. So there's a good chance that what you find really challenging now, you may not want to do it in the surgery a little bit later. I also think that you know, my father's a colorectal surgeon and I've sort of grown up, uh, adult colorectal, um, grown up seeing uh, a lot of surgeons over the years, a lot of, a lot of medicos and uh, over the years, and what you notice is the people who maintain an outside interest, who um, uh, um, have, you know, have had some interesting changes in their career, um, that they are often the people that, are, in my experience, far more uh, enjoy their work far more, um, uh, give far more, aren't as jaded, um, and, and are still going to work, enjoying it. You know, Coming to the to the children's regularly for the liver transplants, and I'm sure there are various stages where you think, oh, shit, I wish I'd had a yet another call, but you still see the enthusiasm which he turns up to do another 10 hour operation. It's quite time. Can I explain that sounds like a long time? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I was wondering, Prof. James, what's the most memorable procedure that you've been a part of, do you think? Well, I, I think everyone seeing outcomes and uh, and I was just talking to a registrar just on Tuesday and said, she said she wanted to stay in general surgery. And I said, why? She said, well, I like the, and the chaos and the sepsis. <laughs> Everything, else. <laughs> Everything else seemed too neat and nice and orderly. And uh, the transplantation is a little bit. You get extraordinarily sick patients and kids. And they really are transformed. So not, not to be seeing people go home. They actually should be dead. And it's just this extraordinary outcome. So it isn't just one. Event. I think it's repeated, and I think, and you can get a lot of satisfaction from something dramatic like that. But you can also get tremendous satisfaction out of fixing something really simple. And uh, and plastic surgery, I think, is a wonderful example. If you've got the knowledge and the skill to do it, mm -hmm. and it is actually a simple thing. Mr. Alana, thank you very much. So, as much as I <coughs> spoke before about. Cure cancer, and that's thankfully something that I do fairly regularly. Um, <laughs> one of my. <laughs> 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 one of my favorite things that I do is I have a question. One of my most memorable, or many of my most memorable uh, patient interactions have been in the palliative setting, um, where you have someone who is desperately unwell, um, has a set amount of time to live. And I remember a young woman with, uh, who was uh, with metastasis all through her chest and <coughs> she didn't, um, coming into the clinic. Sorry, not the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she was the strength of her whole family, which was, which was amazing to see. And uh, she, you know, she, had, she was obstructing her hair a little bit. She was really struggling with reading. So the doctor had a relatively simple intervention of laser bronchoscopy for a stent in about months. And I remember seeing her in the, in the postdoctor room, and she was kind of looking, she was like, how do you understand how you first again? Okay. And, finally, and her whole family was just so grateful. And, and when she when she did uh, die, they invited me to the funeral, and they sent me from the cars. And, I mean, that was, I think it didn't be cancer that day, but that was kind of like saying, you know, we've already done some cases and proceeding with that. We've finally just had our, our final speaker come in, so I might just get Mr. Dundee to introduce himself quickly. Hi, I'm still Dundee, I'm the Initially, 
the science of the need for transfer and practice of the medicine. I went through my surgical training, pretty much interested in everything, every different surgical specialty before I settled on neurology. I'm a subspecialist in neurology.
the system. Um, I think that uh, when I was trained, I believe in the public system and uh, I'm here because of the public system. But by the time uh, I left the public system, it was starting to let us all down, certainly in my field of surgery, I suspect it's in better in other fields. Unfortunately, it keeps most of our stuff is elective. And because it's elective, it's easy to ration care in the public system. There's waiting list to get an appointment in the public outpatients to be put on a three-year waiting list for your joint replacement. Got to a stage where my conscience um, wouldn't find that system. Uh, and so I think that it's probably the hardest system was to take a public system. Fortunately, places like the Equirk now actually have registrars. So there's orthopedic registrars, general surgical registrars, ICU registrars, ED registrars, and we're able to do the things that we lost in the public system in the private. Okay. And I'd say the next question to the group of staff. Um, what advice would you think are the key attributes of a good surgeon? The difference between us and physicians is that in your position, God bless them for being able to be well because you don't do as much. You get to titrate your therapy. So someone can come to you with an undefined problem, you can start treatment and then you can bring them back in a couple of weeks and then double the dose, half the dose, change the medication. So you have some opportunity there. When you're surging the therapies are binary, there's you don't know if it's going to be the right one, but you have to choose whether to operate or not. And once you do make that decision, you have to stick to it because you committed the patient to the risk and the student appears to have And I think that's Every facet of surgical care, intraoperative decision making, preoperative decision making, postoperative care is ever I think you have to have the balance of <laughs> ego and humility um, because you have to have the ego to be able to lead a team, you have to have the ego to be able to say this is the right decision now. Um, the humility to recognize that you, when you make a mistake, you have to give it any impact. The patient, and that you uh, have to then be able to admit that you've made a mistake and go and talk to that. Uh, for me, it's talk to the parents most of the time, say that there has been a mistake made, or you know, even though I've trained and done this uh, training for the last few years, I'm still not able to help your child or your child like that. So that's true of any good doctor. Absolutely honesty. Which is a bit about what I'm saying. Absolute honesty with yourself, with everyone else, with your bosses, like, and attention to detail. Or in my residence and my knees, I can teach most people to operate, almost anyone. Stefan's at the back of his hand to talk, I can teach him to operate. Um, you know, you can teach anyone to operate, but you can't teach someone to be completely honest about their ability, about what they can achieve for the patient, about when they're stuffed up, about when things have gone wrong, even though they haven't stuffed up, about and that's what I'm looking for. And I'm looking for someone who I know would make with if they order a test, look at the result, they'll act on the result, they won't go home and go, maybe someone else will look at the result. This doesn't matter. Absolute attention to detail. Everything else you can learn, but those are sort of innate qualities that I think people have a lot of trouble with learning. You do need resilience because you make mistakes and you would have to live with it. And go, um, it's very easy to be successful. It's quite hard to live with actually making a mistake that may be interesting, or maybe just have an outcome that isn't. So you need resilience to cope with that. Mm -hmm. you live with it tonight. Anybody else have anything to add to that? No, I think we're good. Not all people who begin into surgery are natural leaders. Often they develop that through the training and we're leaders in this a great team of people who provide me. We need to listen to the conditions we work with. 
there's some stuff like in the wars and the views and and also specifically um is a behavior thing that can be a key catalyst in uh and just having some insight and some honesty. Um it's all worth your while buying Professor Ian Harris's book. Ian's uh, Professor of Fred Surgery in University of New South Wales called Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo. And uh, we have in our hands as surgeons the ultimate placebo. Uh, and uh, Ian's book, most of the surgery we do is not evidence based. So the challenge that Ian sets out to all of us is to actually do the science, do the studies that actually can actually tell us which surgeries are actually beneficial to the patients and which are purely a placebo. And uh, being an orthopedic surgeon, Ian um, <coughs> points out that the Scandinavians, the Finns, have been brave enough to do control study of a sham knee arthroscopy for a degenerate knee versus an arthroscopic surgery for the knee and shown there is no difference. As long as there's a scar on the knee, we will work as well. We can do something in the knee at an arthroscopy or we can just make a scar on the knee. In my other fields, all my colleagues sitting here, and uh, most of the stuff that we all do, we do because we think it's the right thing. And the challenge to us all is that we actually put it to the scientific rigor that our physicians do, that many of the things we do currently we don't have the science to actually say. <laughs> so you do have to like using hands and have to like cutting, you have to like stitching. Yes, but I think that's overemphasized in Maybe. what in what medical bit. students think they need to become surgeons. I mean you can't be an absolute class. <laughs> but yes, but I think you can learn to operate, you can learn to be careful, you can learn the skills. So you might, I mean, I, you know, you might not going to be a basilar aneurysm clipper, but you can learn to, you can learn the skills. But I think that's always a little bit overemphasized. Lots of students come to me and go, I'm not sure, I've got, I've got a bit of a tremor. Oh my God, come and see my hands under the microscope. <laughs> I've got a bit of a tremor. I'm, you know, I wasn't very good at, at, at needlework, um, so maybe I don't have it to be a surgeon. I think that is, it is, it is not actually the most important it's not the skill. Most important. Yeah. It is a skill. It is an attribute. I wouldn't grade it at all. Most important, mm -hmm. but it's an attribute. So you can tie your shoelaces. Intern. He was about to retire, and he, I remember him saying that 
if you finished your surgical training when you're 32 or 30 or 35, it didn't really matter. Because you still had at least 30 years to work. So, took okay, away that sense of urgency that maybe I won't finish this till I'm 36. You probably just flame out a little bit later than if you started 30. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of concern um, among students and trainees that we pick up um, about the increasing length of time that it takes to get through certain training. Um, and Dr. Barkley, Dr. Barkley, you mentioned um, your interest in improving the efficiency of systems. Do you think that there are any solutions, any real solutions that um, would work um, against this growing bottleneck? Enjoy it. It makes it fun, and it is very structured. So you know what you're going to do in the next four or five years, and that is in some ways it's rather nice. And the other thing I noticed is when you finish this, you, you stop seeing what other people do. So when you get to train, you get to rotate amongst various surgeons. And once you get a position, that's it. You tend to lose that ability to go and see what other people do. And that's it's an extraordinarily interesting. Thing. See what different surgeons do. You should all certainly think about, you know, at the end of your training, going overseas um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, you know, to have just been away is one. You know, the fact that you've gone away and come back, but you may be coming back to one of the places that you've trained. You know, you immediately have this aura about you. you bring something different back, even if that might be uh, a passport with a few more stamps in it. Um, but at least you, you know, you might be able to bring a different aspect. Um, makes you realise one what's done well at your centre that you're coming back to, but also what's not done as well. So you can you can uh, appreciate that, um, and more importantly, the the connections, the collaborations, the camaraderie that you have. In particular, as you if you tra start to travel a bit more as a, as a, as a surgeon, uh, doing work, you know, from a surgical technical point of view, or teaching, or academic meetings, right that you have across the globe is you know, something that we are very lucky to have to embrace. So you know, look at the look at the fellowships that are good from a technical and a teaching perspective, but also from a, a, a social and uh, you know, environment. And the good thing with Brexit is you probably going to be much easier to go to the UK. <laughs> I was just going to add, in terms of the length of training, it takes the same time now to become an interventional cardiologist as it does to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. Don't think that surgeon that it's going to be much harder for you as a surgeon than it would be if you were going to be a special physician. The same length of time. Moreover, if you are a barrister or finance or any professional and you have your own business, you're going to work just as hard and do the same hours that you're going to do here as you want to be a surgeon. The good thing about it is you get to be a surgeon at the end of it. 
Surgeons in general, I'm sure you will agree, probably don't have a great reputation in terms of EQ, empathy, particularly neurosurgeons. <laughs> <laughs> Not all surgeons are the same. I think that's the surgeons. I think we are very conscious of other people about patients. I think that's come across in some of the conversation tonight. Caring for the patient is still ultimately the most important thing that you can do. If your parent, if your patients think you care for them. And that'll cover a host of sins. I think, um, I'm, well, I'm not sure that what I say is empathy, understanding, caring for your patients, and the other issues I think are empathy with colleagues. I think the difference is now, I think we are very much part of the team. There's no doubt that surgeons are less dominant. Charter, it's the code of conduct. <laughs> um, I wrote, 
the other people, the first uh, interrupted and flexible training policy, mentoring committees, I've been through blah, 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 blah all of that. Um, and I've been, you know, sort of gone through all of these iterations of the college, surgical behaviour and of sort of people and teams and all of these sorts of things. And I've worked hard for that, but sometimes I kind of think, oh, you know, well, we just can't be being fair or, you know, why don't they just toughen up or blah, 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 lots of things that I've thought about. But actually it's come home to me in the last maybe year and a half that there is only one reason to make this change in the college and for surgeons and everyone to act better, and it's not just surgeons, for everyone to act better, because basically it produces better patient care pretty much proven that. So if I care about my patients, it is no use me acting like an idiot, which I certainly do on occasions. Uh, I'm in a tough case, someone hands me the wrong thing that I've used the same thing for 15 years and all of a sudden they hand me a different thing and I lose it. You know, stuff still happens, but the whole point is if I make people scared, scared to ask me a question when they think it's going wrong that I don't know, I'm not noticing, but they're noticing and they're too scared to say something. If I have people not able to speak up, if I have patients not able to tell me something that they think is important, then that actually deteriorates their care. And the best functioning teams all trust each other and they're the teams that look after patients better. So actually, I don't really care about it coming to front of mind anymore. I don't really care about being fair or this or this or that or anything else. All of those things follow from all of us trying to work in a way that does the absolute best thing for our patients. And the only way we can do that is to not have anyone in the hospital scared or feeling demeaned or feeling intimidated or feeling anxious or not wanting to come to work or thinking that that person over in the corner there is not the one to speak to, but I'll have to go to six different sideways ways to get my point made because I think it's important. So I've really sort of changed around in the way I've thought, even though I've worked on this kind of stuff for a long time and done a lot of work. It's all, if, if you turn it around and we're all here to look after the patient and actually all of this stuff is about best care for the patient, it becomes very easy worry about your behaviour being because why is that person complaining about me or why is this or why can't I be angry because everyone's nasty or no one's good or this person's hopeless. It doesn't matter if they're hopeless. We've got to work with their hopelessness to do the best situation <laughs> and it makes it all very much easier. And you don't actually have to be nice, you just have to do the best thing with your patient. <coughs> But we're not all that, Bill, so then we just have to do the best thing for the patient as an exercise in patient care. It's easy, I mean, it sounds good, but it's about treating people in a way that you yourself and whether that be the patients who you're looking after or colleagues who you're working with, irrespective of what their role is. I mean, historically, patient image of what's leading you is dominating and paradigm as a sort of um, and behaving in a way that they really didn't want people to be behaving towards them. And I think that really has changed. Yeah. Yeah. It should be a kind of this is what this is, you know, there is no different plans for it. You know, one has that, the other, it should be, yeah, everybody has a role, everybody has a place, and it's all going to be what we need to do. It's the general philosophy that holds that kind of effect. So, no, these are need to operate with the because we are. So your great insight. Thank you all. Our panel session to an end, and you all have plenty of opportunity to ask us any more questions over food and drinks. And before we quickly wrap up, we have a quick announcement from our colleagues at Specialist Suggest. So I'm Jess, um, I'm probably the most junior person here. Um, I'm a resident of the Royal Children's and um, I'm involved with a group called Specialists Without Borders. 
Um, and I think a, t a theme of tonight has been about um, the culture of teaching and surgery and in medicine in general, but in particular the culture of teaching and trying to improve people's skills in surgery. Um, and one of the themes that many people brought up was that um, teaching overseas. And um, an organisation close to Prof Drummond and my heart is um, Specialists Without This, which is a not-for-profit organisation which takes um, a whole range of people, about 30 people, um, over to areas of need every year and, um, and does some teaching there. And so we teach junior doctors, surgical trainees, medical students, nursing students, and our aim is to try and improve practice of sort of a diverse bunch of people. Um, and we also have medical students who come with us. And um, as Prof Drummond says, if you want something done, get a medical student to do it. And I think this is really wise. Um, and so everyone in our group works to the highest level of their capacity. Um, people, um, the surgeons, um, teach the surgical trainees who are dealing with incredibly different circumstances. The um, junior doctors teach medical students and the nurses teach our nursing program. And so, and the medical student's role is to try and organise all this gaggle of people. Um, and it's a great, it's a great trip. Um, it's in August and I'd love for you to come and have a chat with me about it. Um, we've got a strong relationship with the Surgical Students Society um, as their calendar each year raises funds for our organisation which make our trip possible. So I guess this ties into a few themes of the night and please come and have a chat with me about specialists of that borders and how you can be involved. Thanks, Jess. So firstly, we've got a reminder for everyone tomorrow. We've got a neurosurgical uh, uh, emergency lecture tomorrow in Lovell Theatre, 5 p.m. by Kate Drummond at the Royal Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> So to conclude, we'd like to thank all the surgeons who've come in and given up their time to really talk to the <laughs> talk to the students um, and share some of their reflections and their journey with us. Um, so we have a small gift as a token of our appreciation for you guys. Uh, you can all join us in thanking the surgeons. For <laughs> we also have a few surgical registrars with us here today. Um, and they've given up, given up their time to, I guess, answer any of your questions about current surgical training and the early years of surgical training and stuff. So we've got Eliza Mert from the Austin, um, surgical registrar from the Austin, and we've got Ash, registrar from the Royal Melbourne. Yeah, and we've got Stefan with us as well. Yep, just back there, um, neurosurgical registrar from the Royal Melbourne as well. And now we'd like to also just thank everyone who made the night happen. Um, Izzy and Shreya and everyone at the SSFM team, uh, especially to the subcommittees, Austin and the Royal Melbourne subcommittees, who've actually worked really hard for the night and setting up the food outside for everyone. And we'd also like to thank Shane and our MD1 reps, Ryan and Shilpa, and also Nick, our gold sponsor, which is outside as well. And we've got Freshman's Bakehouse, who's provided the delicious food for us that's waiting outside. Finally, thank you to everyone in the audience who've come here tonight. We hope you really enjoyed the night and took away something with you. So, thank you. <laughs>